you're good tonight, say, I'm good. All right, that sucked. If you're good tonight, say, I'm good. I'm good. Well, I'm good. I'm glad that you're good. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, again, if this is your first time being with us, my name is Pastor Micah. I am the youth pastor here, and I'm so excited for you to come and hang out with us. I'm excited for you to be here tonight if it's your first time. Um, if you see people walking around and they have lanyards on that has a name on it, that is our leaders. If you have any questions, please see them. They have their name tags on. They're kind of sitting around and all that. But we kicked off a new series last week called No Problem. Say that with me. No Problem. And we talked last week about those words that we don't often like to say that we say sometimes in life, I am sorry. You ever have to apologize to people for something that you've done? I mean, I have. Even this week, I had to apologize because of my attitude, because of my actions. And I had to say to someone, hey, I am sorry for the things that I did. I'm sorry for what I committed to you and what I did against you. And so we talked about real life stories last week. We talked about the importance of being able to say, I am sorry, and really mean it. We talked about no fake apologies. We talked about how when we go to God, we ask for forgiveness, and we make sure that it's genuine. We make sure that it's real. Well, tonight we're going to continue on this series called No Problem, but we're going to kind of shift gears tonight, and we're going, to, we're going to go in a different approach than we normally would. I mean, what I want you to do for a moment, we played a game tonight about villains, and the title of my message actually tonight is called, it's called No Problem Part 2 Villain Edition. Because let's be honest, we live in a culture where when we read books, we play video games, we watch movies, we watch series on Netflix, there's always a good guy and there's always a villain. There's always a villain. And villains are these characters in stories that are oftentimes the bad guys. They're the ones that the good guys are fighting against and there are villains. And, and we read about them and I was thinking about like this whole scenario with villain. Like what if Voldemort really just went to Harry Potter and said, listen, man, I got no problem with you. We're cool. That'd be the end of the book, right? Like, it wouldn't even be like, it, it, there wouldn't even be anything happen. What if, what if Darth Vader would have never, like, tried to go after his son Luke? Think about that. Think about the stories that we know that have villains and heroes. What would happen if characters in these stories decided, you know what, I'm not going to do this. What if Thanos was like, nah, I'm not going to snap? I'm not going to snap. I'm just going to work together, and we're going we're gonna to create a peaceful universe and not make everybody disappear. That would be a weird story. It would be a very short movie. It wouldn't last very long. And so we're familiar with villains. And if I could be honest tonight with you, oftentimes in movies, if it's a really good villain, you got me. I like a really good bad guy. I like a really good villain. I like that villain that makes you think. I like that villain that you can kind of connect with. And if I could just tell you tonight, sometimes we're like watching movies and we're reading books and we're doing all these things and there's villains. And then we're like, you know what? Like I can really understand that villain. You ever do that? You ever watch a movie? You read a book? What villain can you really just understand? You're like, I get why they're doing that. I get why they're upset. I get why they're mad. And you often find yourself relating more to the villain than the hero of the story. And that sounds crazy, but that's the reality of life sometimes. And he, there, there are so many villains that we read about and we see in movies and things. And like my, one of my favorite villains of all time is Loki. Loki is one of my favorite villains. Because I believe this dude just straight up misunderstood. He's one of the kids that was adopted. He was misunderstood on, on who he was and how he was, and he was always trying to live up to authority. How many of you have big brothers or big sisters that you always got to live up to, right? You always got to be like, why don't you be like them? I have an older sister. Why don't you get straight A's like your sister? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? It's like, no, I want to be my own self. And so when I watched the Avengers and I watched all these movies and Loki came on, I was like, I really like this guy. I like his story, and I can kind of understand what's going on. And it's really weird that sometimes when we encounter villains, we can see through their eyes. And we've decided that, you know, like, I, I kind of understand. I kind of feel bad for this bad guy. And we see that in, in these movies. But the reason why villains connect so real to us sometimes, because in everyday life, sometimes there's villains in our world. Sometimes there are villains that are on TV. There are documentaries about villains, villains that do all these crazy things. And there, there's been Netflix documentaries, HBO Max, or villains, serial killers, all these types. There's real villains in our world. We can connect because we understand that there are really real bad people in our world that do really bad things. But I want to tell you tonight, I'm not going to be talking about the serial killers or those villains. No, I'm not going to talk about those villains. 
I'm going to talk about villains that we have in our everyday life. Villains that might cause us problems sometimes. Villains that, that might offend us sometimes. Villains that might pick on us. Villains that sometimes through their careless acts and words, they make us feel like we're their enemies. Because you got to understand that oftentimes when people are coming against you and people are talking bad about you, it oftentimes makes you feel like I'm the good guy, they're the bad guy. How many of you have ever been in that situation where someone starts getting up in your face, they start talking all this smack, they start, start talking about your family, they talk about your grandma, your dog, they talk about everything, and you're like, enough's enough. And you draw that line and you see them as the bad guy, they're the villain and you're the good guy. Right? I'm the good guy here. I'm not the bad guy, they're the bad guy. They, they really started all of this. Well, what's interesting is when we were talking last week, we were talking about this whole thing with apologizing. And in this whole time with villains and all these different things, many of the times when we read in the Bible, we can see people that were definitely villains in the Bible. There were some not good dudes in the Bible. There were some kings that were not good. There were some characters that were not good. But what I'm learning about life is villains and heroes both need forgiveness. I will say that again. Villains and heroes both need forgiveness. And really, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Because when you read in the book of Psalms in the Bible, it's incredible. King David, this character, writes, uh, writes this song in the Psalms about being unfairly accused and attacked. Have, has anyone ever accused you of something you haven't done? Right? It frustrates me so bad when someone's like, did you do that? I'm like, no. It happens in our office all the time with our refuge staff. Someone be like, someone will like take someone's pen or someone will take someone. Like, did you do it? No, I didn't do it. Well, you did. No, I know you did. I did not touch your stuff. I promise you, right? Like we have Nerf guns in our office and when we're not paying attention to one another. We shoot each other with Nerf guns, right? And so like sometimes if like I get really annoyed, I hide everybody's Nerf guns, right? And they're like, I know you touched my Nerf gun. I'm like, I didn't touch your Nerf gun. I didn't take it. I didn't have it. I don't have two stowed away so that when you come at me, I'm just like, ha, ah, no. Listen, I get blamed for things I don't even do. You've got blamed for things you don't even do. David in the Psalms, he's, getting, he's, he's unfairly accused about something. And not only that, an enemy is attacking him. A physical enemy is attacking him. And I don't know about you, but if someone accuses me or even wants to attack me, it's not going to go very well. It's not going to go very well. There's going to be some problems. There's going to be some drama. There's going to be some issues. And I don't know about you, but like sometimes there, there, there's really these different ways we deal with problems. If someone has a problem with you, number one, there's a fight response. You're like, all right, let's do this. Right? Like you're ready to fight back. Then there is a flight response. You're like, peace, I'm gone. Like you run away from your problems. You're like, I'm going to go in my room. I'm going to put a blanket over my head. I'm going to eat some Cheetos, and I'm going to listen to some Taylor Swift. Right? Like I'm not going to nothing. And then there's the frozen approach, right? Like when someone comes at you with a problem and you just freeze because you don't know what to do. Well, it's very interesting that we find in Psalms, chapter 17, verses 6 through 7, this is what David does when he encounters a problem. It's on the screen behind me. This is crazy. He says, God, I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Show me the wonders of your great love. You who save by your right hand those who take refuge from your foes. All right, so when I read this, I was like, this isn't the reaction I was really looking for. Instead of focusing on being so angry and frustrated, David literally shifts his perspective toward God. Because when you look at this, like, he's, he's saying these things. God, you'll answer me. God, you are powerful. God, you love me. God, you will help me. It's a perspective change. Because listen to me, young people, when people hurt or offend us, it oftentimes feels like a really big deal. Do you ever have someone ruin your day because they said one thing to you? Someone, you, you, you got up, you were in great mood, man. You made it on the bus on time. You made it to school on time. Things are going great. In first period, all of a sudden, someone says one thing to you, and it ruins everything. It ruins everything for you, and your, your day is totally messed up, and things are, are, are just, just wrong, and, and it's a big deal, and it might seem impossible to forget. Have you ever remembered? Do you guys remember when people have talked bad about you? Do you remember what people have said about you? Do you remember everything that people have called you and have accused you of and all these different things? See, we store them, and we remember them in our mind, and we can't get them out, and these issues, like, they're not minimized. We don't forget about them. They are happening. 
But you know, this is all a matter of perspective, right? Like all of these things that happen to us are a matter of perspective. See, when our feelings are hurt or we're feeling angry about what has done to us, the problem seems huge in the moment. It might be all that we can see or all that we can experience. But if we zoom out just a little bit, we can see things really differently. See, zooming out is exactly what needs to happen. See, what, what happens is this. We're, you know, we're in this little Blair County, Pennsylvania, Central PA, right? We've got this whole entire world, this whole entire thing that's going on. And, and we have this whole world that is happening. But here in little Pennsylvania, in little Central PA, in Blair County, we're having a rough time. And in that moment and in this area, it's like, okay, this, is, this, this problem seems so big. It seems so big. But I want to show you a, a, just a real quick video. There's no, there's no sound, so go ahead and play this video. But this is, how, this is how we see things, right? We have this entire world that we live in and that we are in. We're part of. It's huge. It's ginormous. But then we zoom in, and we're in central Pennsylvania, and we're having a bad day on a Wednesday because something happened to us, and it's such a bad experience, and the problem seems so big. But what happens when we, when we begin to just say, you know what, maybe it's not as big as I think that it is. Maybe there's more to this than I can learn. Maybe there's more. And if I just begin to kind of zoom out just a little bit, if I begin to kind of just uh, step back a little bit and look at this problem that's going on and look at all of these things and look at what, what's being said and what's being done, if I just maybe zoom out a little bit, maybe I'll begin to see things are a lot bigger than I think. Things are a lot more big than I could ever imagine. Because our world is big. Our world is huge. There's this guy in the Bible named Job, right? The Bible says, this is what it says about Job. If there's something to be written about you in the Bible, this is what you want. The Bible says about Job that he was, there was no one righteous like him. Nobody was righteous like Job. This dude loved God more than anyone else. Imagine that's what you're known for. That you love God more than anyone else. And so Job, he had everything you could imagine. He had a family, he had wealth, he had relationships, he had everything that he could possibly want. And then one day it was all taken from him and his life fell apart. And not only did his life fall apart, but he lost his, he lost his kids. He lost his possessions. He lost his wealth. He went through what was maybe the most horrific story that we can really read that, that, that of someone losing something. If I went through what Job went through, I'm going to tell you right now, I'd be a mess. I would be a mess. I'd be angry at God. I'd be frustrated with God. I'd be confused because I'm, I'm God's faith. I'm, I'm, I'm the righteous one, right? Like I'm the one known for loving God. And then, God, you're going to take everything from me? You're going to take my friends? You're going to take my family? You're going to take my wealth? You're going to take all of these things? I don't know about you, but I would demand to know why. You ever have something in your life happen and you just want to know why? Like, why did this happen to me? Why did God allow these things to happen to me? This is what Job said. It's super interesting. Chapter 19, verse 23 through 25 on the screen. Oh, that my words were recorded as they are written on this scroll that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. This is what he says. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on earth. Yet again, not a reaction I would have had if everything was taken from me. But I want you to catch this. Instead of focusing on how big his struggles were, Job focused on how big his Redeemer was. See, sometimes we think that we have such a big problem that no one can handle it. We have such a confusion in our mind that no one can understand it. We have such anxiety that just builds up inside of us and cripples us that no one can, no one can help us with this. There's, there's nothing that can possibly do this. But Job is saying, listen, like, you think your struggles are big? They, they, they might seem big to you, but they're not big to God. See, Job shifted his perspective towards God. When Job says the end, literally in this verse, he's talking about someday, very far in the future, the end. And that's important because instead of focusing on the pain that he's in right now, he chooses to say, no, this is coming to an end because my Redeemer lives. And what's wild is you see the word Redeemer in here, right? Redeemer comes from the word redeem. you got to understand, like, the word redeem is important. Job wasn't just saying his pain wasn't a big deal or that it didn't exist. He was saying that he trusted God anyway. 
knowing that God could transform even his deepest pain into something wonderful. Guys, I understand that your generation has gone through some things. I understand that every day you are dealing with things in culture that no one else has ever dealt with. I know that there's all of these things that are happening in your world that a lot of us don't understand because we're not in it. You guys deal with such a social pressure that we have never known. The depression, the anxiety, the identity, trying to figure all these things out when everyone is telling you how to do this, how to do that, how to do all these different things. But what you do need to understand is know that God can take any confusion, he can take any moment of pain, he can take anything that's going on, and he can make it something meaningful in your life, something that you can use. See, when you trust your God, when you trust in him, your perspective can change. Now we're talking about villains, right? We're talking about heroes and villains. Well, look what this says about enemies. This is wild. In Matthew chapter 5, it says this, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That sounds pretty good, right? Like, I'm going to love people that love me. I'm going to hate people that hate me. But then Jesus says, but I tell you this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Excuse me? There are things I read in the Bible sometimes that I don't, like, don't make sense to me. Because guess what? If you're nice to me, I'm going to be nice to you, right? Like, I'm going to be nice to you. And then there's a side of me, if you begin to be mean to me, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to probably, most likely, 99% be mean back to you, right? Like, if you come at me with comments, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to probably come at you with comments. And see, this is what was going on, and and Jesus is literally saying, now listen, this isn't how you do things. You don't hate your enemies. You actually love your enemies, and you pray for those that give you a hard time. And you might be wondering, why does Jesus want us to pray for people that give us a hard time that hurt us? Well, let me tell you straightforward, it's because they need it, not you. So you know what's oftentimes interesting about the villain stories that we read about that are there? So often, villains are created out of pain. I want to say that again. Villains are created out of pain. And that pain has been caused to them that allows them to become who they are. We read all of these stories and we see all of these things that have happened where oftentimes they're forgotten about or they're betrayed or they're hurt at a young age or their family is killed, whatever it might be. These villains have a birthplace of pain and they begin to live out of that pain. And the saying goes that hurt people hurt people. So if you're hurt as a person and you live in pain, you want others to realize what it is to live in that pain. But Jesus is saying, nope, this is not how this works. In part, I want you to pray for other people. Now this is what's wild about praying for other people. Let me just explain this to you. Praying for someone helps us see the person differently. Because we have a viewpoint of certain people when they're doing certain things. But you begin to pray for that person, you'll see things a little differently. Because you'll be like, man, that dude does not shut up. All he does is make fun of me. All he does is bully me. All he does is come at me all of the time. But God says, I want you to begin to pray for him. You're like, nah, I'll pray that the earth opens up and swallows him. I want to pray like the Old Testament, man. I want to pray like, like Elijah. No, these, guys, these guys are making fun of him for being bald. He's like, I'm going to call bears out of the woods and they're going to come eat you. I'm going to call the earth to open up and swallow you. I'm going to call, I'm going to call a storm down that it takes you out when you're traveling. Those are the kind of prayers we want to pray over our enemies. But God is saying, no, listen, you need to pray for people, and you need to pray differently. And when we begin to pray for people that give us a hard time, it helps us change our perspective of what is going on. And it's like we're no longer focusing on the hurt that we have, but it really helps us understand that that maybe they have a hurt that they need to deal with. And maybe they're hurting all these other people because they're hurt. But I do know this, too, that praying for other people helps us process our pain. It helps us put into words why we're hurt and how we're feeling. Have you ever in your life vented to someone about a problem, right? Like you go into school and your friend's like, hey girl, and you're like, listen, we need to talk, right? Like we need to talk right now. And then you just whoop all of it out, right? As long as, you, and you just go and you're going, you're talking and you're talking with your hands, you're getting emotional, you're talking about it and you vent it. And then when you're done, you feel better. Right? You feel better. You had to get it out. Do you know that it is perfectly 
the most safe place that you could ever be, venting to God in prayer. Because a lot of times when we pray to God, it helps us process our pain. So that deep pain that you have inside of you, listen to me, some of you, that deep pain that you think nobody else understands and gets, that you go home at night and you think about it all the time through your head and you can't let it go, that pain you can process out with God. When you're praying for other people, it helps you process what's going on in your life. It's amazing how it works that way. And praying for someone makes our hearts a little softer. The more we pray for someone, the more likely we are to see our anger and bitterness really shift and leave. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it feels good in life to have a villain that we can blame everything on. Sometimes it feels great because we see ourselves as the good guy and they're the bad guy. But I think there's a better way to do this. I think with Jesus, Jesus invites you to see things in a new way so that you can really be healed. So this is what I want you to understand tonight. When it's hard to forgive people, shift your perspective. When it's hard to forgive people, begin to shift how you see the situation and the perspective of what is going on. And you might say, Micah, that's really hard to do. Like, you're, you're like, I hear what you're saying, but it's really difficult to know that. Because I, I want you to understand that, like, we all know it's hard to forgive sometimes. But most of the time, most of the time, out of all these things that are happening, if we were just to shift our perspective, things would be seen differently. And it may be impossible to shift your perspective, but try to understand what is going on. Try more to shift these things around and be able to say, okay, how do I change what is happening? How do I change? I'm processing things. And rather than seeing people as villains or as our enemy, let's try to see them a different way. See, in the, in the story of David, it's absolutely incredible, right? So David is this boy, and he's anointed to be king over Israel. But there's a problem. This boy that is supposed to be king has been anointed king, but guess what? There's already a king. There's already a king. So imagine that you're a king or a queen in the kingdom, and you're ruling the whole kingdom, and all of a sudden you hear of someone else that's been anointed to be the king or the queen. Is that going to be a problem? Yes. Because this is my kingdom. This is my kingdom. I'm the king of this kingdom. You're not, like, I'm not going to allow you to take this kingdom from me. So what happens is King David then, as a kid, anointed as king, goes off and begins to wander all around. But here's the problem. King Saul is hunting him down. King Saul is going looking for him. He said, I'm going to find him. He said, I'm going to look around in all the wilderness. I'm going to find David, and I'm going to kill him because I am the king. He's not. So as he's processing this and as he's doing this, King David is like running for his life. And King Saul is trying everything he do to try to kill him. Everything he can do. So imagine that's your life for years, that you're just on the run because the king is trying to kill you. That means the king's guards. That means the army. That means all these people are chasing you all around the United States trying to kill you. And you're on the run. But what's interesting about David is this. King Saul saw David as his enemy, but David never saw King Saul as his enemy. There's actually an opportunity that arose where King Saul and all of his men were sleeping in a cave, and David snuck in, and they snuck in there. And one of David's mighty men, David had these dudes. They were bad dudes. They were bad dudes. They were the warriors of warriors. They walked in. They're like, dude, we can, take, we can kill King Saul right now. He's sleeping right here. Let's just kill him. And King David said, we're not doing that. I will not dishonor the king like that. I'm not going to allow that to happen. So even in the opportunity to take out an enemy, David's like, no, I'm going to honor this man. I'm not going to allow him to be killed. See, what you have to understand, just because people say that you're their enemy doesn't mean that you have to be their enemy. You don't have to view them that way. Just because people want to view and hate you doesn't mean that you have to hate them. Just because people are going to come and they're going to do all these things to you doesn't mean you have to do it to them. We shift our perspective. We shift and change how we view these things. How many of you have ever been hurt or offended or upset by someone? Raise your hand. Right? So when we've been hurt or offended by people, it's hard to forgive. 
But I want to give you guys four different things that can help you forgive. So if you want to write these down, if you want to take pictures, I don't care what you want to do. But I'm going to give you four, I'm going to give you four basic things that are going to help us understand how to forgive people. Because these are very important for us. Number one is this. You have to look to God first. You have to look to God first. Like David did, like Job did, when you're struggling with anger, bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness, all these different things, God is the one who can help you. You have to look to God first. When you're dealing with problems, look to God. When things are happening and unraveling in your life, look to God. When things are being torn down in your life, look to God. God is the one who's consistently there for you. God is the one that will continually be there for you when everyone else fails you. It's always going to be God with you. So know that. You have to look to God. If you're struggling to forgive someone, look to God first. Because God is the one. He's with you. He's listening. He's strong. He's powerful. He's able to give you wisdom. Number two is this. Look at the big picture. If you're struggling to forgive others, look at the big picture. Like Job, when it's hard to look past the things that hurt you, try zooming out. Just like we saw on the video. Zoom out so that you can see. You know what? When I'm up close and the problem is here, it's all in my face. It's all around me. But if I take a step back and I zoom out, the problem's not as big anymore. The problem is not as big as I I am when it's all up in my face. But if I take a step back, then it's not. So we have to understand sometimes that we need to look at the big picture. The third thing is this. This might be the most challenging one. You have to look at people differently. You have to look at people differently. And this is really hard because Jesus said, you know, like when we're tempted to hate or dismiss someone, we have the choice to hate them or to love them. We have the choice to show love or hate. Let me ask you, what's easier to do? Is it easier to show love or to hate to people that hurt us? It's easier to show hate. It's so much easier to hate other people when they do things for us. But we have to look to God. We have to look at the big picture. We have to look at people differently. And then this, this is the next thing. We have to pray for them. We have to pray for them. You've probably heard the saying, prayer changes things. But I want you to understand, it's not just that prayer changes things. But the most important thing is prayer changes you. It changes you. Like, try praying that God heals the wounds of those who've hurt you. Ask God to to show them love. Ask God to show them who he is. Ask God to deal with what's going on in their hearts and in their lives. Because if they're hurting you, there's a reason why. So God, show them the reason why they're hurting all the people. Show them why they're hurting all these people. Encourage God to just draw near to them. And then see what God does with those prayers. See what God does with those prayers. See how that happens. And guys, let me be real. Let me just be real. Everybody look at me for a second. I'm going to be real with you. I get this. You may have people in your life that hurt you that will never apologize. You may have people in your life never even admit that they are wrong or that they believe lies. You may have people that will never admit that they've hurt you, that they've deceived you, that they lied about you. You might, you might have people that will say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not forgiving. I'm not even doing any of this. You might have people that do all that. But understand this, you don't have to wait for their apology to let God begin to transform you. You don't have to wait for them. You don't have to wait for other people. You let God do what God does the best way that he can and allow God to transform you in who you are. That is the way this works. That's the way that God wants it to work. So like we have to shift our perspective to make sure the problem's not as big and realizing that there's more to this than just people coming at me being a villain. Because the flip side of the coin is sometimes we're the villain. See, sometimes we're not the good guys in the story. Sometimes it's us because we have been hurt. 
because people have walked out on us, because people have damaged us because of what our family has done, what friends have done. So what we do is we develop a villain mentality to everybody else around us. And we aren't the good guys. We're the bullies. We're the villains. We're the ones starting fights. We're the ones getting in people's faces. We're the ones that are attracted to drama. We're the ones that are stirring up everything. Why? Because we are so stirred up and broken inside that we need God to fix something. See, it's not always that they're the villain that we're the villain and that God needs to do a work in our hearts in our lives so do me a favor tonight if you could sit up in your seats and bow your heads and close your eyes I don't want anybody looking around just you bow your heads close your eyes don't worry about your neighbor to the right to the left and front behind just you right here by yourself I'm going to ask a question. I just want you to lift your hand. That's all I want you to do is lift your hand. You don't need to be, no one else needs to look around. But tonight, how many in this room can say, Micah, I'm having a hard time forgiving someone? Lift your hand. Hmm. Okay, you can put your hand down. There's been people in my life that I've had a hard time forgiving too. And sometimes we have to choose forgiveness every day. No matter the hurt, no matter the pain, every day I got to choose to forgive. I call it present forgiveness, meaning right now in this present, even if they're going to continually do things, even if they're going to continue to talk bad about me, I have to choose forgiveness because that's the right thing to do. We've all had people in our life that we're having a hard time forgiving. So what we do tonight is we ask God, God, help us to forgive because we can't do it on our own. I'll straight up tell you, there are certain things in life we cannot do without God. And this is probably one of them. Forgiving people is one of these things that I don't know if I can do it without God. But the Bible says that God has forgiven me for all of the things that I have done against him. And if my father forgives me, then I have to forgive others. Because the Bible goes on to say, what right do I have to not to forgive others? What right do I have to hold things against other people? Because God doesn't hold anything against me when I ask him to forgive me. So tonight you might have had some villains in your life and in your story that have hurt you. But maybe tonight you are the villain. Maybe tonight you're the one that has caused hurt and pain in people's lives. I'm not going to ask you to lift your hand. I don't want to embarrass anybody or anything like that. But maybe you're here tonight and you know you're a bully. You know that you cause problems. You know you're attracted to drama. You know you're attracted to chaos. You actually thrive in chaos. You love it. It's, it's your comfort zone, being able to just be in the middle of it, be in the drama, be in the, be in the know of everything, calling people out, causing frustration, causing anger, causing issues. Maybe that's you tonight. Sad to say, I know in my life, I've had seasons of being the hero and also of being the villain. Even in my adult life, there are times when the good guy gets put aside and the bad guy steps forward. And God says, I don't want you to be like this. I want you to be like me. I want you to love, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to pray for those who are giving you a hard time, Micah. I don't want you to, to jump back at them. So tonight as we close out this night, I want to pray for all of us. I want to pray for those that are having a hard time forgiving others. And I also want to pray tonight for those who have been the villain in other people's stories. And I don't know which one you're going to connect with tonight. I don't know which one that you're going to be able to relate to. 
But if you want to pray on your own, you can. Or if you want to repeat these words after me, you can. But let's go right now and just let's just take the next few moments and go before God. And let's talk to him. And let's be real. Let's say this. God, I'm here tonight. And I'm having a hard time forgiving people. There have been people in my life that has caused me a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. They've allowed my anxiety to be out of control. They've allowed me to be depressed. They've allowed anger to rise up inside of me. They've caused confusion and chaos in my life. But God, I need your help because I need to forgive them. God, they've been a villain in my life and it's been very hard, but I want to do the right thing. So God, help me to forgive those people. Whoever it is in, in, in your life, students, leaders, I just want you to, to picture them and picture their name and picture who they are and say, God, just help me to forgive them. And you might need to be like present forgiveness, God. Help me every, like just knowing that when I wake up, I gotta be, I gotta ask you to help me to forgive them. But God, just don't forgive them. Let's pray this. Let's pray that you change them. God, I pray that you heal their wounded hearts. God, I pray that you bring restoration, that you do something with the broken pieces of their lives. God, I pray that you will allow them to be free of all of the things that are hindering them. In Jesus' name. Then, God, I realize that sometimes I am not the good guy in this story. And as much as I would like to be, I'm the villain. And I'm living out of the hurt and pain and destruction and the confusion and the issues that I have pl that have plagued me my entire life. And I can't seem to get out of it. I just cause destruction and chaos everywhere that I go because it's what I know. It's what I'm comfortable with. So God, help me to have that peace that the Bible says goes beyond even my understanding. God, I pray for every student who comes from a chaotic environment, whether they're in this room or they're gonna listen online, whatever it might be, God. For every student that comes out of chaos, I pray that you will bring peace now in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for every student and every leader that has come out of pain and hurt and that has built them a foundation that they stand upon. God, I pray that you break that now in the name of Jesus. And the only thing that they stand upon is your word. God, I pray for the confusion that is in the mind that because people have said and done things because we've acted out in certain ways and we've caused confusion in other people's lives. God, I pray that you clear that now. God, I pray that you help me to love my enemies and to pray for those who come at me. God, I pray that that will be something that each and every one of us in this room can do tonight. Help us to forgive and help us to no longer be the villain of the story. And so God, I just thank you and praise you for what you're doing in this room. In Jesus' name. Amen. There's one more thing that I want to say. Just because you forgive people, just because you've offered forgiveness to them, it doesn't mean that you have to be best friends with them. It doesn't mean that they have to be a main character in your story. The forgiveness that you offer to them is to make things right, but it's more for you than it is for them. That you ain't gonna live that way. Everyone says, forgive and forget. Well, it's really hard to forget sometimes. Just being real. It's very hard to forget when people have hurt us. But you know what you can do? You can forgive and you can learn. You can learn. You can learn from the situation to make sure that you're aware that this isn't gonna happen again. 
that I'm not going to allow them to cause the pain. I'm not going to allow them to do things. I'm going to learn from this, and I'm going to allow this to be the process in which I grow and grow closer to the Lord. Because this is what I know. If you haven't been told lately, this is what I know. So that everybody has understanding and no one's confused tonight. I want you to know without a shadow of a doubt that God loves you. That God loves you. If he didn't love you, you wouldn't be created. If he didn't love you, you wouldn't be here. It might be your first time. You might have been, you might be here for 500 years. It doesn't matter. The love of God is for you. And he says that he loves you. And so know that you are loved. And I'm glad that everybody's here tonight. I'm glad that we have new students here. I'm glad that all all the students that have been here forever are coming. This is a place where I want you to understand that God loves you. And we're going to work things out. We're going to walk things out. We're going to, there's going to, there's so much that we have to unpack sometimes. And sometimes it's not easy, but this is what I know. This is the safest place to do it because we're doing it with God. And so know tonight that as you walk through these problems of life and we titled this series, No Problem. If you can put that back up there, that note, the title slide, No Problem. Man, no problem, it's, it's a problem, right? It's a problem. But we want to say, we want to project, it's no problem. But in essence, we really want people to know that when God is with me, it's no problem. It's no problem because God is with me. 